Hello, my name is James M. Kenny, and I'm the guest curator for this wonderful exhibition of American Impressionist paintings that celebrates the 85th anniversary of the Canton Museum of Art. First and foremost, I want to thank everyone that was tremendously supportive of this project. Without your generous financial support, this never could have been possible. Um, moving on, I just thought I would start with one of the inspiring pictures, one of the key uh, objects in the collection, um, which is this fabulous painting here by Ralph Curtis. Ralph Curtis was from a prominent family in Boston. He was close with the Sargent family and um, spent a number of years painting alongside of John Singer Sargent. He produced a few extraordinary pictures that were exhibited at the Paris Salon and the Royal Academy in the 1880s. And this is one of them called Drifting on the Tide. Uh, unbelievably sensuous, uh, evocative picture capturing um, the feel of this tremendous art colony that was, uh, that was active in the first several decades, well, the last several decades of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Uh, Curtis's family, who were very wealthy, um, owned a palazzo on the Grand Canal in Venice. And that palazzo, called Palazzo Barbaro, was the center of the cultural world, the expatriate cultural world in Venice at that time. So it's fascinating as you look at this object to imagine what's going on in this fascinating place. Um, the visitors to the Palazzo included people like Henry James, John Singer Sargent, um, Browning, um, Whistler, just a fabulous group of uh, very talented individuals. Um, another thing I wanted to point out with regard to this picture is when you first look at it, you might go, well, is that really impressionistic? Is that the essence of impressionism? Well, it is and it isn't. It's the beginnings of impressionism. So you have the tightness, the drawing, the sculptural quality, the feeling of space that one associates with salon paintings that were popular in the late 19th century, and this was exhibited in the salon. But when you look carefully at the treatment of the background, the sensitivity to light, the lusciousness of the scene, um, the painterliness seen here, as you zoom in on the figure, those are aspects that we associate with Impressionism. So it's just a bit of a hybrid. And that'll transition to this next wonderful picture over here. Uh, this painting of the Cadoro was painted by Robert Blum, a painter from Cincinnati. There were a number of wonderful painters from that area that went to the art colony in Venice at the turn of the century. Uh, Blum went there four different times, was part of the initial grouping that was active at the Palazzo Barbaro in 1880, but continues there four other times. On his last trip, he does this stunning painting of uh, the Grand Canal. And to continue what I was saying about drifting on the tide, it, it is a hybridization. You've got um, very tight detail, um, wonderful envelope of space, well-orchestrated architecture that one associates with more traditional forms of painting, but then this amazing luminosity, gorgeous jewel-like color, and very active broken brushwork in the water here that associates it with Impressionism. Um, we were thrilled to get this picture uh, for the show, along with this other one here. They're both uh, stunning examples of works from that period. I remember when we first advertised this picture years and years ago, back in 1995, when we had just acquired it from a private collection in New England. We placed it with a family in Columbus, where it still is, but we had calls from the San Francisco Museum, Cleveland Museum, act asking about this very rare, precious object. Continuing our discussion of the Italian paintings that are in this exhibition, I wanted to draw your attention to this superb 
watercolor by John Singer Sargent that was done in 1907. Um, it's a classic example of American Impressionism in that it's very much focused on the depiction of light, on capturing a moment, a transitory feeling. So it's fascinating when you compare this superb work with more academic, tightly constructed works of roughly the same period. So you can see the evolution of style toward pure Impressionism. Sargent, as many people know, was a superb portrait painter, very well known, um, but he begins to tire of that work. So in 1907, he devotes, basically stops doing portraits and focuses his energy on his watercolors. Those are purchased in blocks by major museums such as the MFA Boston, the Metropolitan Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, to great acclaim. And all of a sudden, he joins the ranks of the top American watercolorists, including Winslow Homer, um, Prendergast, and then later on, Marin, Demuth, and many others. Uh, so it's really quite extraordinary. Uh, this watercolor has been in Canton's collection for over 20 years. I remember first seeing it um, in a gallery in New York City and uh, recommended it to some of the people on the committee. They were thrilled and happily it entered the collection of the Canton Museum. We're going to start uh, with this section of, the, of this exhibition. Um, this, this, folk, this section, part of the exhibition focuses um, on some of the pure American Impressionists, um, particularly um, William Merritt Chase and Child Hassam, who are two of the most famous figures in the history of American paintings. Um, I'm going to start first with the watercolor here by Child Hassam that was done in England in 1889. He had just returned from Boston where he was painted a series of Boston street scenes that were extremely well reviewed, very well appreciated. He goes back to England and does this exquisite watercolor of a young lady reading a book in a little provincial town. Um, and it's quite noteworthy in that it's the classic subject matter of a genteel subject, everyday scene, pastoral, um, often American painters painted imagery that was picturesque like this, but it's also really important in that it was a work that was purchased by the museum several years ago, and it prompted Max, the director of the museum, to start thinking about, gee, this picture's been very popular, why don't we do a show on American Impressionism? So it sort of is the inspiration for the current show. But as we move over here, um, it's a little bit easier with this large-scale picture by William Merritt Chase, who, as I said, was an extremely famous American artist. Um, the focus on this wonderful landscape that he did in Shinnecock in the 1890s. By the time that he did this painting, Chase was one of the most celebrated teachers in the United States. Very successful school in New York City, and then he decides to establish a school um, in Long Island, a place called Shinnecock in 1891. And this is one of the masterworks done from the series that he did there, depicting mothers and children out along the dunes or on the seashores. And it has the classic elements of American Impressionism. Wonderful interest in sunlight, um, feathery brush strokes, rich colors, um, also the genteel subject matter that one associates with the American Impressionists. And it's fascinating really when you compare this exquisite picture with one done by one of his peers, Child Hassam, the same fellow that had done the watercolor over here. Because here you've got a picture done almost exactly at the same time, 1894 versus 1895. And it's exquisite, it has the broken brushwork interest in the momentary, interest in everyday subject matter that one thinks of with the Impressionists. But what's fascinating about it too is that it anticipates what some of the realist picture painters will 
will explore the beginning of the 20th century. People like Bellows that were part of the Ashkin School or urban realism, where they're focusing on some of the grittier aspects of urban life. So although this is an exquisite picture and has a wonderful poetic quality, it's a very intense subject. I mean, imagine being the cabbie on that cab in the snow and the blizzard it was not much fun. So there's a certain sort of heroic, um, grittier quality to it that I think is fascinating. Um, I remember when I first saw this painting, it was at, uh, there again, at a gallery in New York City, but I had just seen it through a transparency. And when my brother and I took it out of the crate, I went, oh my God, the color, the tones, the subtle nuances, these exquisite lavenders, blues, uh, and then the rose-colored lights, uh, we're just like, wow, that's amazing. And it's um, interesting that Hassam, although he was really a pure impressionist, he was influenced by James Whistler, an artist who was very much interested in tone, art for art's sake, for an elegant presentation. So you see a hybridization once again from pure impressionism to the tonalism of people like Whistler. We're gonna continue our discussion of American impressionism with this exquisite little painting by Edward Pothast. Edward Pothast was one of about 12 Ohio artists that are included in this exhibition. We purposefully included a larger group of artists from Ohio to celebrate the fact that there were so many institutions in this uh, very uh, thriving communities that were active in Ohio at the turn of the last century that fomented the construction of museums and art schools and really encouraged this whole group of fabulous artists to take the stage. Pothas became very famous for these exquisite jewel-like impressionist paintings of beach scenes. He had worked very hard in Cincinnati, uh, taking night classes, working as an illustrator and a lithographer for, for two decades before he got up the money and the courage to go to New York City in the mid-1890s. While he was there, he saw an exhibition of the famous Spanish Impressionist, Joaquin Zorroya, who had done some exquisite beach scenes along the coast of Spain. People believe he was inspired by them and he started painting these beach scenes that were incredibly popular. So he launched his career really through the vehicle of these exquisite beach scenes, many of which were of this scale. Oftentimes, he worked best in the 12 by 16 format. Occasionally not. Um, there's a wonderful Gloucester harbor seat in the show that's quite large. But it was interesting that these jewel-like objects caught people's attention. Um, you may notice as you're looking at these objects that they're not formally presented. And we thought it would be fun for people to see the process of putting together an exhibition like this. And it's quite a procedure from orchestrating the loans and shipping the objects, bringing them in, making sure they're properly packed, then producing the catalog, writing the, the text panels. Uh, so it, this helps give you a little sense of what's behind the scenes. Um, I put, I thought we might focus on these other two pictures and compare them a bit with the pothas. Pothas, you have pretty much pure impressionism, going a little bit strong on the color. So as we're heading toward post-impressionist, use of a little bit of arbitrary color, bright color. But then when you look at the Peterson to the right, similar subject, seaside subject, groupings of figures, but very different in the way they're handled. They're simplified, there's a strong emphasis on line, um, on calligraphy, patterning. So it's as much about the surface of the picture as it is about walking into the picture, which you're doing more with the Pothas than with the Peterson. Peterson was one of the most famous American women painters. We've included five or six different, I think six different women artists in the show. Um, five examples by Jane Peterson. She came from the Midwest as well. Uh, very modest background in Elgin, Illinois, moves to New York, 
and by the teens is painting some of the most important works on paper of any artist for that period. And this is considered to be her masterpiece. We were thrilled to get the loan. It's on the cover of the major monograph by Jane Peterson. But there's a fascinating story over here as well. Um, another step away from Impressionism, even though Theodore Butler married into the Monet family, he's an Ohio artist, studied in New York, moved to Paris, hears about this little town where Monet's painting, goes out there with one of his buddies, Theodore Wendell, and he ends up staying. He meets the stepdaughter of Monet, they get married, and Butler becomes a central figure in the thriving American art colony in Giverny, which was composed of many painters from the Midwest. But what's interesting about the picture as well is that it's the classic agrarian um, subject matter that one thinks of when one thinks of the French Impressionists, particularly Monet. But the palette is more infused, it's stronger, it's richer, a little bit more arbitrary. And that's something that you think of when you think of the post-Impressionists, people like Vincent van Gogh. So it's a step toward that aspect of modernism. Uh, having been fortunate to be in Giverny many times, I love this picture because it captures the atmospheric quality, the haze, that kind of mistiness that one associates with Normandy. <laughs>